This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again. It's Mises Weekends. We're joined by someone I'm sure many of you know, our friend, Dr. Per Beeland. He teaches at Oklahoma State University. Uh, it, it specializes in, obviously, he's a professor of economics, but also specializes in entrepreneurship uh, and, and is a protege of sorts of our own, Peter Klein. Uh, he has written a couple of articles for Mises.org of late about both AI and big data. And with Mark Zuckerberg in Washington this week talking or testifying before Congress on, on uh, data collection, among other things, we thought it would be a great time to bring him in. So, Pear, it's good to see you. How are you? Doing great. Thanks for having me on again. Well, it was a little disingenuous this week, don't you think, to see uh, members of Congress grilling Mark Zuckerberg about data collection and privacy when these guys are supposedly in charge of oversight of things like NSA? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the great irony that apparently the NSA is okay, but if a private company collects information that we give them, then it's a big problem. They don't want competition, I guess. Right, but I notice one thing you point out is that in the wake of some of these revelations about uh, perhaps Facebook's leniency with your data, uh, their share price has suffered. As a result, there's a market mechanism, a market correction at work. Yeah, I mean, there's there's nothing that punishes you as harshly as the market. The market is merciless. If you make a mistake, then you you can be completely wiped out. And that doesn't affect the government, of course, but it affects all businesses. Well, th- there's a lot of, of discussion about big data generally and whether supercomputers and algorithms and the emergence of AI can somehow change what what Hayek would call the knowledge problem in economics and allow us to plan things in a centralized fashion better than we could before and in, in effect overcome Hayek's objections. So g- give us your thoughts about this. Well, I mean, the, what I put in my Mises.org article before was this Bing has this uh, prediction engine for sports results where they try to predict the result of all these uh, football games and ice hockey games and so forth. And they run all the statistics available, everything they can. And they run it through very, very powerful computers and they do machine learning and all this stuff. And they get it right about maybe two thirds of the time. And, and of course, with all that data, you should do better than mm-hmm. just a coin toss. Uh, and, and they do, but they don't actually get closer than two thirds. And that makes sense because the, the past does not decide the future. And it doesn't matter how much statistics you have, you still cannot tell exactly what's going to happen in the future. We're talking about people here. We're not talking about dead mass. I just wonder if if the data revolution, the digital age is going to to intensify uh, this kind of thought, though, among some of our friends in economics. In other words, you have this this great quote here where you say, there are no constants in human action. I'm not sure that Keynesians believe that. I'm not so sure that they don't think on some level that this stuff can't be modeled to the nth degree. Yeah, I'm not sure about Keynesians. I'm not sure what they believe, actually. But, I mean, for us, it's pretty obvious that everything starts with value and valuation. And that is something that we experience directly through consumption. And anyone who misses that tiny little point, which mm-hmm. is still the, the sort of very fundamental, if they miss that, then they're going to go wrong. And they're, they're doing that over and over and over again. It seems like the, the cult of the modern age is economic illiteracy. Well, so you mentioned the, the Bing experiment, I, uh, predicting football, NFL results. If they're getting two-thirds, don't the sports books in Las Vegas do that well or better? I mean, they have skin in the game in, in the sense that they're handicapping against their, their, with their own money. Yeah, they probably do a better job. But, I mean, the, what they're doing is not just run the data. I mean, the data, the data are important, of course. I mean, you can't just neglect all the data. Uh, and, I mean, a, a, a team that is better on paper seems more likely to win over a team that is a lot worse. But then there's uh, there are a lot of other things involved as well. I mean, the weather, do the do the psychology of the players. Um, maybe one of the star players have had personal issues lately and stuff like that, so they don't really play on their their at their best. Things like that, and those things are involved as well when when these bookies put put odds on games and stuff like that. But that's not part of the Bing engine, and the machine can't understand that. But it's this human element that Mises stressed 
going on almost 100 years ago now, and, and it seems like it's missing in, in amongst futurists. They think that they're going to engineer some better future using, using models, using algorithms, using data. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, what they do when they talk about AI and robots, building robots, it's very fashionable right now to talk about how that suddenly means that we don't have to work, which is, I think is a glorious thing. It's not a, it's not actually a problem. Um, but somehow they get from robots making robots to there's no scarcity mm-hmm. and we don't need to prioritize anymore for some reason. But machines, they can produce stuff, but they also need to know what we want and what we value, because otherwise they're going to produce the wrong stuff. We're going to end up with a lot of resources in the wrong places. That that could be a disaster rather than what they what they predict, that it's going to be marvelous. Well, and Austrians, of course, talk a lot more than other schools about the structure of production, about the temporal element in all of this. So we generally tend to think in terms of time, but then capital and labor and land. From your perspective, is AI different? Is it different from existing capital only in degree, or is it actually some sort of qualitative different thing that's going to need a new category in economics? Well, it's not a new economic category. That's just ridiculous. Um, It's capital, like any other capital. I mean, it might be intelligent capital, but mm-hmm. I mean, our machines today compared to machines before are more intelligent in a sense as well. I mean, un- unless they become human sort of and they have a consciousness and they understand subjective value and things like that, they're still machines and people will still need to direct them. You need to produce this, but not that because this is what we value. Without that, I mean, they're, they're just going to guess and using big data and, and big data is it can get sort of close, but it's still it's not going to be get as close as entrepreneurs with skins in the ga- skin in the game. Well, we but we still have this fetish about unemployment, uh, jobs rather than yeah. productivity of the economy. We've had periods of automation and mechanization in history. Certainly in agriculture, very few Americans today work in ag. Uh, we've had this in factories, assembly lines. All of these shifts in the past haven't rendered us all. Uh, completely without work and, and uh, watching Oprah on the couch all day. Uh, so do you think, again, do, do you think these, these fears about AI and, ro- and robots are overblown amongst, among economists? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, it's, I don't see it as a big problem. And transition is always a problem because people are used to certain things and they have certain expertise. And before they get, are able to take on new types of jobs, they can hurt. On the other hand, I mean, we're going to end up with a, in a world with so, such high standard of living because of this development that we don't have to work as much at all. I mean, people now are talking about it. Oh, my goodness. In the future, we don't need people to drive, uh, drive trucks across the country for 40 hours every week. Well, OK, but why would they, first of all, drive 40 hours a week? Why do they need full time in the sort of sense from the 1940s? Because that's what we're talking about, right? It's not even necessary to work 40 hours a day. That's, that's necessary because it's, it's in, in legal statutes that that's full time, uh, but nothing else. I mean, imagine if, if in the future we would become so much more productive. And that's what we're really talking about here, because capital only makes labor more productive. And with AI and robots making robots and so forth, all we need to do as work is really to direct them to the right places. We don't need to work more than maybe 30 minutes or an hour a week. And that's not a lot, but, but we can still support a great, a luxurious lifestyle working that little. And I don't see that as a problem at all. The, the problem is the transition, but somehow Keynesian thinking and the whole, in the long term, we're all dead sort of thing that we shouldn't, what, we shouldn't look further than the short term means they're completely missing the point that after the transition, that's the real result. And that's glorious. I mean, imagine how much more physical labor our great, great, great grandparents did in agricultural societies, backbreaking physical work, preparing meals, cooking, cleaning all, all day long. Uh, yeah, we, we, surely we work far less than they did. It, yeah, no kidding. And I mean, children as well. Children in, in coal mines were working 80, 90 hours a week to help sustain the family. Today, what do, what do children do? I mean, they're, they're out there they're with their iPhones trying to find these 
these <laughs> whatever they're called these uh pokemon uh, goes yes exactly those things and try to throw balls at them or or whatever in this virtual world that's what they're doing and they're going to school and being fed knowledge uh, i don't i don't see that as a big problem really that that they don't have to go to the coal mines and what we're going to see is the same sort of development into the future it's just going to go a little faster well, we talk about the structure of production. We talk about higher and and lower orders of of goods. Uh, do you think AI ha- or machine learning will will compress the temporal structure of all this in in certain industries? Will it expand it? Uh, how how should we look at it uh, in, in terms of, of where it fits? Well, that's a, that's a very good question. I'm not sure. I mean, introducing it to begin with is extending it, pretty obviously. Um, then, I mean, how to actually talk about different stages of production that sort of depends on what AI will take over. And it might become very problematic if, if we start to integrate production processes from the very start to the very end, um, which I, I'm guessing that these, these people would prefer having an AI basically be, be, a uh, in charge of smashing rock to producing cars, the same AI, and then, then sort of maximize that process, then we're going to have a, pro- a big problem because then we're not going to use resources in the, in the economic way at all. We're not going to be economizing on the resources. Well, there's this endless uh, debate in economics, labor versus capital. We, we might view capital as accumulated labor, but nonetheless, there are, there are a, lot of, a lot of economists obsess about labor and what it's doing and the value it's creating. And, and this is actually, of course, one of the big criticisms of capitalism is that it supposedly uh, steals this surplus labor value. Do you think uh, um, AI is going to change the labor versus capital debate? Do you think it's going to play a role in it other than where there are you know, always this concern about jobs? Yeah, I, I don't know how it's going to affect the debate because the debate is so confused. So it might be confused in a different way, I suppose. Um, I mean, people seem to believe sort of in, intuitively that capital provides you with power and power over labor and power over well, everything, basically, because you can buy the government and, and whatnot. Um, and I mean, that's completely wrong. So unless people start thinking about it the right way, that capital mm-hmm. is not power, it is just a way of making labor more productive and producing value. I mean, if you own, I mean, Menger told us this already in 1871. I mean, if you have a machine that can only produce uh, tobacco and people stop smoking, that machine is worthless. And it's the same with any capital. Uh, so if, if you own a lot of capital, the only reason that will, will make you wealthy is that it benefits consumers. So there's really no conflict here. There's no conflict at all between, between capital and, and labor. Capital really liberates labor. Right. That's what it does, because it makes labor more productive. Well, that said, uh, Dr. Beeland has a couple of articles on Mises.org of late dealing with these very topics. We will link to those. And I think the takeaway pair is, is maybe that there really is nothing new under the sun. And a lot of the things that uh, Menger and von Berwerk and Mises uh, explain still apply. There's no such thing as new economics. So with that pair, thank you so much for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.